Never before has our nation and our world been in greater need of competent, principled, knowledgeable, far-sighted, nonpartisan, inspiring leadership. Together we are facing enormous challenges. The warming of our planet, due in large part to the burning of fossil fuels, dependence on foreign oil, much of it from terrorist sponsoring or otherwise dangerous authoritarian regimes, dramatic destabilizing fuel price fluctuations, dangerously poor air quality, and major public health crises. Either we delay, obstruct, and wait for others to take action with disastrous results, or we pull together at all levels of government, in business, and in each of our individual lives to develop and implement effective solutions. Developing and implementing solutions to these serious problems is at the core of real leadership. When I served as mayor of Salt Lake City, I sought to do our part in addressing these challenges. And, recognizing that we could inspire effective action by others, we launched the Salt Lake City Green Program in 2001. A major component of Salt Lake City Green was our Climate Protection Campaign which has achieved very positive results, many of which can be replicated by other governmental entities, businesses, and individuals. Our focus has been on finding the most effective solutions to our most pressing challenges and in taking advantage of the tremendous positive opportunities currently available to reduce global warming pollutants, gain independence from foreign oil, enhance national security, avoid destabilizing fuel price fluctuations, improve local air quality, and enhance public health. These challenges and opportunities all converge at the point of the same two fundamental solutions. First, conservation and greater efficiencies. Second, utilization of clean, renewable sources for the energy we require. We are able to inhabit the Earth because of a delicate balance of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere, which acts much like a blanket. Sun rays travel through the atmosphere to the Earth, where some of them are reflected back. The heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere capture some of the radiation and reflect it back to Earth. An accumulation of too many global warming gases adds immensely to that atmospheric blanket, causing dangerous global warming. Since 1958, an observatory atop Mount Mauna Loa, Hawaii, has taken the measurements reflecting a shocking increase of more than 20% in the average annual concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere during just the past 49 years. Carbon dioxide is the cause, directly or indirectly, of about 80% of all global warming. Carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for about a hundred years or longer, so the cumulative effects are tremendous. The burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, releases a total of over 29 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere annually, and the amount increases each year. Tracing the trajectory shown here forward reflects a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the early 20th century to the end of the 21st century. To stabilize carbon dioxide emissions at double the level at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which doubling is widely considered the threshold of disastrous, irreversible climate change, we will have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 80% or more by the year 2050. That's an ambitious goal, but it can be accomplished. The enormous increase in greenhouse gases has caused a very significant increase in average global temperatures. This trend spells catastrophe if we do not reverse it. The scientific evidence is conclusive. What we are experiencing is not simply a natural phenomenon with a shift in temperature consistent with variations occurring over thousands of years. From ice core samples, scientists have determined that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere never exceeded 300 parts per million in the 800,000 years prior to the Industrial Revolution. Now, after burning enormous amounts of fossil fuels 
emitting unprecedented amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide is 385 parts per million, 36% above pre-industrial levels, and it is rising rapidly. This is how the polar ice cap in the Arctic appeared in 1979. This is how much it melted, more than 20% by 2003. The ice that remains is only 60% as thick as it was 40 years earlier. If current warming trends continue, little if any of the Arctic ice cap will be left at the end of this century. This could spell the extinction of many plants and animals. A recent scientific analysis predicts that the Arctic will lose all sea ice by 2030, and therefore Arctic polar bears and other species will not survive. The Arctic is warming far faster than the rest of the globe. Since the 1950s, Alaska has warmed by an average of 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Warming has been even more profound during the winter months. In parts of Alaska and western Canada, winter temperatures have increased by as much as 7 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 50 years. These temperature increases have already had devastating consequences. Located on the border of northwestern United States and Canada is the stunning Glacier National Park. From 1850 to 1993, there was a 73% reduction in the area of Glacier National Park covered by glaciers. In the 19th century, the park featured about 150 glaciers. Just more than a century later, there are now only 25. Here we see the astounding decrease in Shepherd Glacier from 1913 to 2005. The melding of Grinnell Glacier between 1910 and 1998. And the devastation of the Cheney Glacier from 1911 to 2005. Scientists predict that, at the present rate of warming, there will be no glaciers in Glacier National Park by 2030. The name will be the sole reminder of what once was. A rise of up to one meter in sea level, which has been predicted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, would submerge major coastal regions around the world, including several major metropolitan areas in the United States, 17.5% of Bangladesh in an area where 13 million people currently reside, and 6% of the Netherlands. This is how New Orleans looks today. This is how it would look with just over one meter rise in sea level. This is how San Mateo, California looks today. This is how it would look with a one meter rise in sea level. If we do not take action to effectively address the root causes of global warming, by curbing emissions of heat-trapping gases, the entire coastal population throughout the world may become re environmental refugees. Hurricane Katrina, with tens of thousands of environmental refugees, will seem like a picnic by comparison with the hundreds of millions of people killed or forced from their homes in coastal regions around the world because of rising oceans. Global warming also results in killer heat waves, in 2003, the August European heat wave broke all records for heat-related deaths. There were 35,000 deaths, with the death toll in France alone nearly 15,000. The risk of major heat waves has doubled due to climate change. Droughts, the introduction of mosquito-borne diseases in areas where mosquitoes were previously non-existent, and the killing of entire forests by beetles that were previously kept under control by cooler temperatures, have all occurred and will become more frequent and more severe because of global warming. 157 nations, including every major industrialized nation except the United States, have signed on to the Kyoto Agreement and are taking aggressive measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know that Kyoto is just a modest beginning 
and the carbon dioxide emissions must be reduced far more than called for by Kyoto if we are to reverse the trend toward disastrous climate disruption. But as with our many longtime allies around the world, many of us in the United States recognize the importance of collaborative worldwide action to meet the challenge of global warming. If the prospect of devastating droughts, floods, hurricanes, killer heat waves, mass starvation, and other climatic disasters are not enough to get some people's attention, then perhaps they will respond to the worsening quality of wine and catastrophic impacts on the ski industry worldwide. Global warming is threatening the world's ski resorts. Downhill skiing could disappear altogether at some resorts, while at others a retreating snow line will cut off base villages from their ski runs as soon as 2030. Although those impacts are certainly trivial in comparison to the human misery and extinction of species caused by climate change, they are clearly harbingers of human and ecological crises to come. The scientific consensus that our planet is rapidly warming and that human actions are causing the warming is overwhelming. The International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, in which thousands of scientists from over 100 countries have participated, concluded in its 2007 assessment that the Earth's warming is caused by human activities, particularly the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. Even the Pentagon has recognized the urgent need to combat climate change. Influential Pentagon advisor Andrew Marshall commissioned a 2004 report entitled An Abrupt Climate Change Scenario and Its Implications for United States National Security. The report predicts that abrupt climate change would produce extremely dangerous conditions in many regions of the planet as countries accelerate nuclear weapons development to defend and secure dwindling food, water, and energy supplies. Alarmingly, the report's authors view climate change as a vastly greater threat to global stability than terrorism. Some people in our community asked, why, as mayor, I was focusing on global warming? Their view seemed to be that combating global warming should be someone else's responsibility. My response has been that we are all going to be severely impacted. With the help of ICLE, participating cities are making a huge difference. We're all in this together, and we all need to work cooperatively and do our part to effectively combat climate change. Despite the abandonment of U.S. national leadership, Salt Lake City has been committed to the Kyoto process. In 2002, on the eve of the Salt Lake Winter Olympic Games, after developing a plan with ICLE, I committed Salt Lake City in its municipal operations to at least the Kyoto goals. We set a goal to reduce emissions in our city operations by at least 21% below our 2001 baseline. We made tremendous progress in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Utilizing a software program developed by ICLE, we were able to determine our 2001 baseline and measure our progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. By 2006, we reduced emissions by 31% from our 2001 levels, attaining almost 150% of our initial goal six years before the 2012 target date. We have the means to combat catastrophic climate change resulting from global warming. Every city, every state, every nation, every business, and every individual can do its part in achieving meaningful, substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Poor local air quality is a problem facing many of our cities. Bad air days in Salt Lake City severely impact the public health, recreational opportunities, sustainable economic development, and overall quality of life. On beautiful, smog-free days, 
Salt Lake City is stunning. The outdoor recreational opportunities are unsurpassed. And the quality of life is extraordinary. These are the sorts of cities we and those who come along in the future deserve. As we combat global climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we will also reduce the criteria air pollutants that harm all of us. To meet the most crucial environmental challenges, we must, working with organizations like ICLEI, provide leadership. We must empower others to take action, and we must effectively advocate in order to bring others on board. Leadership requires that we become informed about the choices before us and to choose wisely, even in the face of vocal opposition. Among our most important choices, do we pursue policies that promote sprawl, dependence on the automobile, traffic congestion, air pollution, and global warming? Or do we pursue cleaner air, preservation of open spaces, reduce burning of fossil fuels, and greater transportation opportunities through mass transit? Another choice that requires informed, effective leadership is whether we continue to rely in many parts of the world on the generation of electricity by dirty, dangerous coal-burning power plants. Or will we move toward more electricity production by clean, renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and geothermal generators? If we do not choose to significantly reduce our dependence on coal, our choice will lead to a radically different, largely uninhabitable planet. We must unite behind a demand that our elected officials and regulators demonstrate responsible leadership in committing to no more atmosphere-destroying coal-burning power plants. Here's one way I have sought to get the message across. Playing lead guitar with some young rock musicians at high school assemblies and one of our Step It Up events after rewriting some lyrics to some old rock and roll songs. Our first step was to determine everything we could do in every department of city government to operate in a more environmentally sustainable fashion. We completed a sustainability inventory enabling us to catalog our environmental and economic resources in every department and to ascertain the opportunities we had to make improvements in every area, including water, energy use, and air quality. We started out with those things we could immediately accomplish and which every governmental entity, business, and individual can also do. We replaced all our light bulbs in our city hall. By replacing the energy wasteful incandescent bulbs with high-efficiency compact fluorescents, we saved over $33,000 a year in electric bills 
and dramatically reduced the amount of electricity we used. If every household in the United States replaced just one incandescent bulb with a compact fluorescent bulb, the emissions impact would be equivalent to taking one million cars off the road each year. Besides the greatly reduced emissions from coal-burning power plants that would result from wiser use of compact fluorescent bulbs, there are significant financial savings. With part of the money we saved from converting our lighting, we became the state's largest purchaser of wind power. By taking these two simple measures, we save taxpayers money and reduce carbon dioxide emissions by over 1,100 tons each year. Then we moved on to our traffic signals. By changing to low-energy LED traffic lights, we eliminated 500 tons of carbon dioxide emissions and saved $50,000 in lower electrical costs. In addition to our focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions through the promotion of clean, renewable electricity and reduced energy consumption, Salt Lake City was the first city in the nation to voluntarily offset all the carbon dioxide emissions from city-related air travel by preserving rainforest in Costa Rica. With each airline ticket, we paid an additional amount to the Pax Natura Foundation for sequestration of carbon dioxide equivalent to the amount of greenhouse gases emitted by the flight. We worked to create a clean fleet by converting our city's fleet of vehicles through right-sizing and using clean alternative fuels. We got rid of 41 gas-guzzling sport utility vehicles and purchased smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. We had 89 compressed natural gas vehicles in our fleet. We purchased five new three-wheeled parking enforcement vehicles, which use one-eighth as much gas as the vehicles they replaced. We even bought a new gas-electric hybrid police car shown here. We also passed an ordinance that allows drivers of low-polluting cars to park throughout the city without ever having to pay at parking meters. Acting in our personal lives consistently with our publicly voiced values is, I believe, vital to good leadership. My personal car is a compressed natural gas vehicle powered by the cleanest internal combustion engine made. It emits almost no criteria pollutants, and I used to fill it from my gas line at home. Residential gas lines are not necessary, however, in Utah, where we have the second largest number of gas stations with natural gas in the country. As part of our Salt Lake City Green program, we encourage all sorts of alternative forms of transportation. Bicycling improves personal health and helps create a vibrant community. With the use of bicycles across the United States and from Belgium to Torino, Italy, we delivered a message of peace, youth, and the environment to our successor as the host of the Winter Olympic Games without the use of any fossil fuels. As this sign reminds us, bicycling doesn't require the burning of any fossil fuels. We're committed to creating a bicycle-friendly community and have added several miles of bicycle lanes in recent years and installed 45 new bike racks in our downtown area. Walking is another healthy, clean form of transportation, but one that does not come naturally to many auto-dependent Americans. It also helps create a more interesting, vibrant community. To encourage walking, we must make it as safe as possible. To make walking safer, we took several measures, including countdown timers for pedestrians, pedestrian-actuated overhead lights at mid-block crosswalks, and orange flags at pedestrian crosswalks for people to carry with them as they cross the streets. People made fun of the flags in the beginning, as often happens when we try something different, but now the flags are very popular. A few years ago, we were acknowledged as the most improved city in the United States for pedestrian safety. Although there was a good deal of derision aimed at me when I first put in the flags, they became popular enough that my campaign for re-election touted the success of the program. In the following Abbey Road scene, I play the role of a pedestrian flag-carrying Paul McCartney and notice bare feet and all.
It's now a lot safer to cross a street in Salt Lake City thanks to one man. Come together, vote for Rocky. Buildings are one of the primary sources of energy consumption. There is much we can do to conserve the energy used in buildings. Buildings are responsible for 43% of carbon dioxide emissions in the United States annually. We cannot combat catastrophic climate change without pursuing sustainable, energy-efficient building practices. I issued an executive order requiring that all new buildings owned and operated by Salt Lake City government must be LEED certified at least at the silver level, as must all major renovation projects. The Salt Lake City Council unanimously endorsed my high-performance building initiative and now requires all projects which receive city funds to be LEED certified. Methane is a major global warming pollutant. At our wastewater treatment plant, we capture the methane and utilize it to fuel a cogeneration facility, which produces about 6 million kilowatts of electricity per year, about one-half of the energy requirements for the plant. This results in a reduction of the greenhouse equivalent of 13,600 tons of carbon dioxide each year. Also, methane at our landfill has in the past been captured and simply flared. Now the methane is used to provide electricity to a neighboring municipal energy provider, meaning less electricity that has to be generated at a coal-burning power plant. Committed to smart growth principles, Salt Lake City looks far into the future to plan our city in ways that promote walkable and transit-oriented communities. Many people resist greater residential density in their neighborhoods, but when it is well-designed and close to transit, greater density can help make a community more attractive, safe, and environmentally sustainable. My administration took a transit-first approach to all development projects, including opposition to highways pushed by state legislators, so that future growth will not be accompanied by more automobile congestion, more roads, less open space, greater dependence on foreign oil, and increased pollution. But with public transit opportunities afforded by rapid bus systems, light rail, and commuter rail, as well as cleaner air, the preservation of open spaces, less traffic congestion, and greater energy independence. All of that translates into better public health, better sustained economic development, better quality of life for all, and greater national security. Much can be done by government at all levels to empower others to contribute toward solutions. We seek in every way possible to empower other governmental entities, local businesses, and individuals to take effective actions to combat global warming and resulting catastrophic climate change. In order to empower local businesses, we created our E2 business program. E2 stands for Environmentally and Economically Sustainable. City staff took what we learned about conservation and utilization of cleaner sources of energy to local businesses, inventorying what those businesses were doing and what options they had for waste reduction, recycling, more efficient transportation, conservation of energy and water, and improving air quality. Over 70 local businesses participated in our E2 business initiative. They found higher employee morale and very positive acceptance by customers. Our next step was a program for citizens. Salt Lake City E2 citizens can register online. There they can establish their carbon footprint and learn about the tremendous positive contributions they can make in the areas of transportation, energy, recycling, water, food, and health. We asked E2 citizens to set at least five goals in these areas to help minimize their negative impact on the environment. Over 600 people joined the program. We also created a member card that E2 citizens presented at participating E2 businesses for discounts on goods and services. Salt Lake City teamed up with our local electric utility to promote the purchase of wind power, getting people to switch from coal-burning production of electricity to clean renewable sources resulted in carbon dioxide emissions reductions equivalent to keeping 2,700 cars off the road each year. 
In 2001, Salt Lake City began offering a 90-gallon blue recycling bin to residents free of charge. Soon after launch of the blue bin program, the amount of material recycled in Salt Lake City increased by over 87%. To promote recycling of aluminum cans, we held a competition asking young people to submit ideas for an advertisement to be produced and aired by a local television studio. There are lots of ways to recycle aluminum cans. Jimmy! Time to come home! Coming! Look at this, honey. Look at this toy. I like your dress. Thanks. I recycled it myself. But this is the best way. We faced tremendous opposition to our light rail system before it was built in 1999. Notice the headline reflecting a call for our transit director's termination because he had the audacity to advocate for a light rail system. Time proved, however, that Salt Lake City's light rail system was exactly the right idea at the right time. Ridership of our light rail system far exceeded even the most optimistic projections. On average, 52,000 Utah residents board the light rail trains every day. Success is breeding more success as those who once adamantly opposed light rail are now clamoring for it in their communities. In four of the most conservative counties on the planet, voters actually voted for a sales tax increase for transit, a result of the success of our initial system. Recently, a heavy rail commuter line between Salt Lake City and Ogden, Utah opened, and in its first weeks, the front runner is at full capacity ridership. No matter our own successes, we will effectively combat global climate change. Only if we advocate so that others, other governments, businesses, and individuals, join with us in doing what they can to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. Robert Redford and I, along with Ickley, hosted three annual conferences, Sundance Summit, a mayor's gathering on climate protection. Since the summit's inception, mayors from throughout the United States came together to meet with numerous experts to learn the science of climate change and to strategize about actions we can all take to combat global warming. Coming together and sharing success stories is a crucial means of leveraging our successes into even greater positive impacts. Other nations have proven that existing technologies can combat disastrous climate disruption. Germany's extraordinary commitment to renewable energy, particularly wind and solar, has reduced its emissions of global warming pollutants by 19% since 1990. Denmark generates 20% of its electricity by wind. Nearly half of the world's wind turbines are produced by Danish companies. Manufacturing associated with wind power employs approximately 20,000 people and contributes nearly 3 billion euro to the Danish economy. In the face of this growing catastrophe, we are in dire need of competent, principled, far-sighted leadership, leadership that acts with integrity and in the public interest. Many of those in power have been self-serving and dishonest, manipulating scientific reports, and doing all they can to mislead the public. They have served the interests of their Saudi tyrant friends and the rapacious oil and coal companies as they cavalierly dismiss the devastating consequences to the inhabitants of our planet now and far into the future. The consequences experienced already from human-caused global warming include the severe melting of glaciers around the world, the Arctic ice cap, parts of Greenland and the Antarctic, rising oceans, desertification of millions of acres of previously productive lands, the killing of major coral reefs, the destruction of major forests by bark beetles that now survive warmer winters, major droughts, and significantly reduced snowpack in areas that depend upon snowpack for water supplies. Business as usual spells disaster for our earth and for many, if not most, of its inhabitants. Hundreds of millions of people will be driven by rising oceans from their coastal area homes. Water will be unavailable to farmers and others depending on major glacial systems, 
including the Himalayas and the Tibet Qinghai Plateau, which feed all the major rivers of Asia. Forests will be killed off at a rapidly increasing rate. Deserts will expand, fisheries will collapse, many species will become extinct, and heat waves will kill more and more people. Planet Earth will be a very different, far less habitable place for our children and those who follow. The solutions are at hand. If we act aggressively, treating the situation as the emergency it is, an emergency that far surpasses the attack on Pearl Harbor or the threat of terrorism. The challenge facing us is of the greatest significance humankind has ever experienced, and it presents us with tremendous positive opportunities, if only we will urgently embrace them. We have the means to make a real positive difference. With all nations, all businesses, and all individuals working together, we can create a safer, healthier, more compassionate world.